My name is Danny B. I created the Crowned in Purpose podcast to share the journey that I'm on along with my guests on finding our purpose through Christ. We will discuss the complexity of life routines, kids, work life, and family responsibilities, as well as bring light to how our routines are impacting our one-on-one time with Him. Our goal on this journey is to be intentional with our time with God, as well as create life balance to achieve our full potential, spiritually as well as personally. The foundation of this journey starts with Matthew 6 and 25. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. New episodes will premiere every Monday, so please listen, share, and rate as you take this journey with me. I am Danny V, and you are crowned in purpose. Welcome to the Crown and Purpose podcast with Danny B. Thank you for joining me. It is an exciting day. Why? Because I have another guest for you. Her name is Dana Scott. She has her own photography business here in Atlanta, Georgia. And you guys get to learn so much about her purpose, her journey, and how photography saved her life. So Dana Scott, welcome to the show. How are you today? Uh, Good morning. Uh, Thank you. I'm doing very well and I'm pleased and excited to be on your show this morning, but I'm doing great. How about you? I'm doing excellent. It is almost coming up time for the holiday. So adjusting (laughs) as we all should be (laughs) Uh, getting ready to, uh, what did they say? I don't want to do a lot of shopping, doing all the online shopping, but I know you uh, do photography, and so we're learning more about where your journey started with that. And I'm going to ask you the first question, because the holiday season is one where I take pictures, and they always don't come out too great because I have kids. (laughs) We'll get into that (laughs) later. They're a little difficult, right? So, Dana, tell the listeners who Dana Scott is, right, and what it meant when you wrote this. I saw this online, and you wrote, photography saved my life, literally and figuratively. Tell us about that and what that means. Uh, Well, I would start out by saying um, I've been in Atlanta most of my life. Uh, My father and mother were military uh, when I was born. And so I had the opportunity to travel quite a a lot of different places, experience a lot of different people and cultures, et cetera. Um, So with photography, initially, my love for photography started when I was in high school on the yearbook staff, as well as... um, Got interested in professional wrestling and used to go to the shows and take photos and sell them. And so that kind of piqued my initial entrepreneurial spirit with photography. But as far as photography, uh, I decided to major in photography at Georgia State University, but changed my major because back then, this was in the 80s, they taught it more as a fine arts method versus giving you the skill sets to learn and shoot professionally. So um, I ended up changing majors and um, had a whole different career path. But in 2014, when I say that photography literally saved my life, um, I was out shooting by myself at Wine Creek in Peachtree City, and I fainted out there. Um, This had been after shooting about four hours. So I thought I had just, um, you know, just overheated. And um, that was the cause of the fainting. But I had a follow-up doctor's appointment that Monday, and I said, well, let me just run some blood tests just to be on the uh, safe side. And through a series of blood tests over the course of about eight weeks, found out that I had cancer, um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, a rare version of that. So if it had not been for shooting down there at Lion Creek and Peachtree City, never would have known about the cancer diagnosis. And by the time they started chemo, which was two weeks after diagnose, official diagnosis, Um, my levels were so high that I was in the danger zone at that point. Literally, yes. Um, But figuratively, after the initial chemo and just reassessing my life, because I had been for the past 14 years at that time in corporate America, and I was a true workaholic and working was my life. I loved it. it. It just, it was what it was. But I reassessed what was important in my life because again, was something of a health challenge. So I was kind of looking back and I decided I wanted to follow my passion, which photography is my passion throughout my whole life. But I decided I wanted to, uh, while I was still physically able to do so, uh, I wanted to shoot professionally. So I opened up a photography studio and went from there. So literally, yes, the 
uh, feigning led to a diagnosis and figuratively from the standpoint that I decided to follow my passion, which to me has ended up being my purpose in life now. Amazing story. Yeah, that that's one of those situations where, um, and, I, and I love how you said, hey, I was out there shooting. If I wasn't there, I would have never known, or maybe I would have been at the wrong place at the wrong time. You know, you never just mm-hmm. know, but it was so purposed in a sense to get the right help you need and to have an amazing doctor to get you treated in that time frame as well, because you hear so many stories of where people catch it too late. Or they right. never knew at all. So it's amazing to not only talk to you and, and you be present and be healthy, but more importantly, being able to live out that purpose and, and your talent. So that leads me to the next question, um, Dana. When COVID-19 took place, what did you have to do differently to sustain your business? Has your faith been tested during this journey as an entrepreneur, especially because I know you have a studio and that means everybody can't come to the studio all the time. So tell the audience a little bit more about how you had to re- readjust your plans or your business model to fit during COVID and let them know how that that really has either impacted your business or actually you've sustained it or, or grew it even more? Uh, yes, I do have a studio. Um, initially, when I uh, started the business full time in 2016, I opened up a commercial storefront um, in Fayetteville. And uh, after two years, I actually had a flood in my house. And um, flooded all three floors and of course a lot of it had to be rebuilt so at that time I decided well let's do away with all the overhead I have with the commercial space and uh, build out my basement and you know basically have a home-based studio which is just under 2,000 square feet uh, for the studio itself so bringing that studio home and been working from home in that regard um, has been fantastic but um, when COVID-19 hit you know we had the shelter in place and pretty much all businesses were shut down for you know the eight ten week period and because photography is such a personal type of business in that you know you're working closely with people you're touching people you're uh, up close and personal with people, um, that put a whole different spin on being able to maintain the business I actually during the um, shelter in place and then even afterwards, um, because people with the COVID are still very leery about, you know, catching this disease because it is a respiratory disease. But also on my perspective, on my side, I'm very leery about because I'm immunocompromised with the cancer. I still have active cancer, but it's stable. I have to be extremely careful about not catching this disease myself. Right. I, I've done a little bit of shooting since. Uh, um, I primarily try to do it outside. You know, masks are still worn, but obviously the person that's being photographed, their mask comes off during the actual taking of the photos. Right. So um, it's been challenging in trying to maintain the business because I have not been as forthcoming about shooting as some other photographers out there who do not have the hindrance that I do because of my health status. But I've done where I used to teach classes with groups of people to the one-on-one type of training. Um, and I limit the number of people in my studio if I do have a studio shoot. It's generally just headshots now or um, individual portraits. I don't do family portraits and things of that nature inside of the studio because even though it's a nice size studio, we're still confined in a space. And, right. uh, you know, I just still have to be careful. So um, it has been an impact. But the part of your question about if it has tested my faith, I would say no, because my faith goes beyond, I guess, not being able to shoot the way that I would like to in studio. Um, So I've just made adjustments so that when I do take on a client, generally try to do it outdoors, we go to some of the different parks around and handle it that way. No, that's really good. And I, and I love the the fact that you bring up my faith is beyond um, the pandemic, truly in all essence, right? You have people Mm -hmm. who have anxiety, right? Not even having the diagnosis Mm -hmm. that you have, okay? Because for you particularly, you have to be on high alert, but to say, hey, I'm still out here thriving my business, making adjustments and, and, and doing things smart because you have to. Um, Mm -hmm. Some people are not taking it as serious as, as they should, but saying, hey, I still know my passion. I still know my purpose. I still know what I'm faced with, you know, from a, from a, from where I am physically perspective, but I still trust God to keep me in it and then give me wisdom on how to operate. So I love it 
because you're you're not stopping mm-hmm. you're not afraid faith is above the pandemic but then you also are aware yes, like is. hey I have to make these adjustments because my health uh, it is important. Uh, and if I still want to be able to live out my passion, I have to be wise. Um, and I love that exactly. about you um, because when I first met you, I think it's been two or three years now, I remember just mm-hmm. being so touched by your story because you were like, I'm dropping everything and I'm running after this because it, it pulled me from day one. You know, when you talked about in high school and going to school for it and back in the eighties, not even having the ability to kind of make that a thing. <laughs> now you got SCAD, you know, and it's like, that's right. a thing. Exactly. <laughs> that's a real thing. <laughs> uh-huh. So I, I love your journey because uh, it, it just shows your ability um, and your resilience. Actually, you're just a resilient individual. Um, And that's what I loved when I first met you um, and you told everyone about your story because listeners, let me tell you, you won't know, (laughs) Dana don't look like nothing she's been through. Okay, let me say that first. Um, (laughs) Always has a smile on your face and you're so welcoming. Um, Even when I saw your gallery of photos Mm -hmm. and that kind of leads me and segues us into the next question um, just because of your presence. A while back, you shot uh, Kevin David Mm -hmm. from Green Leaf for Oasis Montage. Tell us the Mm -hmm. importance of just that connectivity and being professional, especially in your field of work, because there's a lot of competition um, with photography. I see a lot of people picking up cameras they're everywhere. So tell us a little bit more about that power because anybody can pick Uh, you know, a photographer, but the importance of who you are, your presence and your professionalism. Well, I think professionally speaking, you have to be professional. That customer service aspect is, I think, what uh, differentiates so many photographers because yes, today everybody's a photographer from using cell phones to, you know, buying entry level cameras to even professional cameras, but they put it on automatic and go shoot. But a lot of people have not invested the time, knowledge, and gaining that experience to go out and be a competent professional photographer. So I think creating that experience for somebody and the customer service aspect uh, before, during, and after the shoot is vital in what is going to help maintain a photography business in today's crowded market. And then that connectivity is important. So uh, the connectivity part came through, uh, I think it was in 2016. I was shooting NAACP event for The Citizen, the local newspaper here in Fayette County. And through that particular pay gig, I met a woman who was the publisher and owner of Oasis Montage magazine. And through that event, we connected and I began to shoot for her, uh, for her magazine, for some of the performing art events that she had. And uh, through her, I was able to connect and meet different uh, artists in the music and film industry in shooting for the magazine. And for that particular shoot with uh, Keith David, it was fun because he was actually putting on a actors workshop at Atlanta City Hall atrium. And uh, so I went to go cover that from a photography perspective. And his other co-stars were there from Earl Dandridge to um, Deborah Winans and a couple Mm -hmm. other people on the show. And so I had the opportunity to take pictures of all of them and actually take photos with them as well, which was fun. And then a couple of the photographs from Keith David, his, I guess, inner circle that also had ties to City Hall that parlayed into something else. Um, so again, the connectivity and connecting with people is so important in expanding your business, growing your business, um, or in the photography lingo, getting that next gig. It's it's important. And then there's other ways where you're not necessarily dealing with a celebrity clientele, but through your local Chamber of Commerce, attending those events, attending various networking events within your community to get your name and business out so that people know who you are and are interested in potentially hiring you for a photo shoot. And I just want to touch back on the previous question about sustaining the business during COVID. Uh, Mm -hmm. One of the things you also have to change possibly what type of photography you're doing. So because of COVID and having to be really careful about shooting people right now, uh, one of the things I expanded on was my product photography. A lot of it, a lot of people have their own businesses now. They're selling products on the web. So shooting products for their websites, things of that nature one aspect that um, I turned the business during this time frame. 
That's a good one. And I didn't even think about that too, because you have, um, I've seen so many people buy those, I don't even know what they're called, like a soft box and they're taking pictures with their cell phones, you know, with mm-hmm. a little white background. And right. then I've also seen the importance of just having a circle and saying, Hey, who do I know who does photography? Who do I know who, you know, has a, a building I can use? And, and I think that's so important because you and I have met through different people for different reasons. But the cool mm-hmm. thing about every time we go to an event, the room is filled with different expertise. Right. Uh, so you have all these great people who are willing, like you came on the show. Hey, I got you. I'll come on. I'll talk. And then you have other times where you're like, okay, what's the price? Let's talk about it. You know, hey, let's work it out. Or I got this going on. Can I put you in a series of events? Um, mm-hmm. Just like where you met her and then it became more. Um, and I think that's so important. I uh, want to touch on, you said your follow-up process. And I've never actually heard that because I hear a lot of people say, well, I do photography. I shoot them you know, and, and they kind of go to the next gig, right? Can mm-hmm. you just add a little bit about what is your actual follow-up process and how is that actually helpful? Okay, um, so I use a, a workflow in my business. So from the initial contact that I have with my client, uh, whether it's through a lead on my website or a referral from someone or someone just Googled me and looking for a photographer near me. Um, So when they contact me, I reach out to them in a timely manner to find out what their needs and requirements are and try to ensure that one, we're a good match, that I can meet their needs and requirements. Once we've done the photo shoot, it's not where I just give them the pictures and they never hear from me again. I have a process where it's an online gallery. Uh, They can download the photos that way. They can purchase the prints online. Also, we can have what we call in-person sales where we can sit down and go through what the photographs that they want to bring into their home. And it goes beyond digital images because, you know, with everybody having a camera now and cell phones and so many people are happy with cell phone photography, people have gotten away from photo albums that we grew up with which today has transitioned into, you know, printed photo albums and photo books. They're wall art, whether it's an enlarged photograph that's matted in canvas or a metal print, something that uh, they're taking their artwork and they're putting it on their walls. That's important. And then after we've done that photo shoot, I follow up with them. How has it met your needs? What has it done for you? What additional needs do you have? I have several clients that I've turned into um, life long type of um, client. So I may have taken their wedding photographs. And then when they've had their first child, I've taken their uh, maternity shoot. And then I'm not so much into infant photography, but I have done some. (laughs) And then when they get a little bit older, um, you know, doing their family portraits. And so it's that follow up and just, you know, saying, hi, how you doing? You know, what particular needs do you have? You know, what can I do, you know, to help you from that creative art form that you're putting into your home? And so it's just staying in touch with them. Um, And it's not always about trying to sell them something else, but just, you know, how are you doing? Um, You've you've had your baby now, you know, she's two months old, you know, um, are you getting any rest? Are you getting any sleep type? Right, right you know, sleep all night. So um, just follow up. And, um, and then that's also turned into referrals from uh, them to new and additional clients. So Perfect. No, I love it. And I, and I love too how you're like, Hey, not, not that stage. I will <laughs> sign up for that group. <laughs> um, and it, it, you have to be real though. Um, and mm-hmm. you have to know like your craft, you know, um, right. and what you're willing and not going to do. So that kind of leads us into the next question. What is some advice that you can give to our listeners who may be afraid of moving forward to pursue their passion? We know your story, any advice that you can give the listeners about it's time, it's now, or what does that look like? Um, I'm gonna give it to you. Well, I think it's important that everyone should at some point fulfill their passion and what may eventually become their purpose. Now, I caveat that with, you know, we still have to have common sense and how we do it. Um, When I decided to open up my studio, you know, I had a life-threatening disease, but I knew that the corporate life was no longer where I wanted to spend my last few years. So I did put money aside. I planned opening up a studio. It wasn't something that overnight I decided, okay, I'm just going to do this. Unfortunately, I never married. So, you know, it was just me, myself and I that 
you know, was able to take care of me. So I had to still plan and um, put things in place to allow me to open up this business before I just walked away from a very well-paying job. So you could start out part-time. I mean, I, I did it part-time uh, professionally as well, especially when I lived in Virginia. So take your time in what you want to do and put plans in place and then uh, follow your plan to get to where you wanna be in doing your passion full time if that's what you choose to do. There's nothing wrong with doing it part-time if that means that you can still sustain your full-time job or keeping your day job and you know shooting on the weekends or in the evenings until you build up that clientele. Because especially in photography, as we've talked about, you know, everybody's a photographer, everybody has a camera now. Um, so it's a very, very, very competitive world um, in order to make money, be able to sustain yourself. I won't even say necessarily at the level that you were when you were working a corporate job, but sustain a level where you can pay your mortgage, your car note, <laughs> and put groceries <laughs> in your refrigerator. I would just say plan, have a plan, make a plan, and then try to follow your plan and start out part time. You don't have to jump into it full time initially, but build up to that level. And that's, that's good. I know a lot of times um, I've had, you know, in passing in conversation and you, everybody has a different perspective, right? You'll have some people mm -hmm. just drop everything, run, go. I'm like, whoa, 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 <laughs> wait, <laughs> I, uh, you know, I want to mm -hmm. use wisdom, right? About my decision. Mm -hmm. I want to pray about my decision and then let God lead me on it. You know, a lot of times people will hear someone else's story and automatically gravitate toward making it theirs, you know? Mm -hmm. And I tell people you have to be careful with that because they'll hear your story and, and oh, I'm running for it. And then there's going to be a story for you. Uh, there's going to be hardship for you. Um, mm -hmm. There's going to be adjustments for you because your story and your life setup is totally different than Dana Scott or Danny B. Um, so all of our stories are different. And I think it's so important, like you said, um, to plan. And if you have to do it part-time, do it part-time because mm -hmm. sometimes that part-time may show you, you know what? I thought I had a passion for it or right. I do have a passion for it, but I know that, Hey, I'm not really too savvy or I'm not there yet in marketing or I'm not there in quality yet. So I can't mm -hmm. just jump out, you know, um, blindsided. Um, but I think it's so important for us to continue to pray and really ask God to guide us and give us that wisdom to make good decisions and good choices. So um, thank you for that. So this is, this is where I really want to take our question because earlier I said, you're, you're such a resilient woman, especially because going through your diagnosis and being alone as well, like you said, you're not married and having to go through that, not necessarily alone because we still have family and friends, right. but not necessarily a partner there with you um, right. 24 seven. So mm -hmm. I want Dana Scott to tell me what the word resilient means to you and, and really truly embodies who you are. Tell the listeners more about that. I would say for me, um, it's been the ability to recover from some setbacks that I've had since that diagnosis. I would say the ability to adapt to change in my life, because physically speaking, honestly, initially the, the treatment was worse than the symptoms that I was actually feeling. And I ended up with some symptoms that are permanent now as a result of wow. the chemotherapy that I went through that uh, challenge my, challenges my ability to walk, uh, challenges wow. my ability to hold and grip things, even holding my camera, you know, my hands and things. Neuropathy is what I ended up developing. But, you know, there's ways to adapt to it, uh, medication, exercise, you know, and continuing to try to do as much as I can, the best that I can. I would say just keep going in the face of adversity because everybody has some type of adversity in their life. And I'm not saying there weren't days that I, you know, was depressed and there right. weren't days that I did have anxiety, but still just to keep going in spite of leaning on family and friends when I needed that shoulder to lean on, leaning on God in my faith and right. letting myself realize and understand and believe that, you know, he's got me. And, right. you know, one of my favorite scriptures, we had talked briefly about um, 
it's Psalms uh, 46 verse one, and uh, where it says, God is our refuge and strength and a very ready help in trouble that we should not fear through the earth shakes and the mountains slip into the heart of the sea. So we look at somebody else and we think how bad they may have it uh, or how bad I may have it, but somebody else is always worse off. And Mm -hmm. understanding that, you know, if we lean on God, we lean on family and friends and we lean on ourselves that we can get through things. It may not be smooth sailing, but we can get through it with just a little faith. And that's been my motto. Some people, you know, they don't like to talk about, you know, if they're stricken with cancer or things that nature, they're very private of their health status. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. For me, talking about it was an outlet for me that helped me to also be able to deal with it internally by being able to share with other people and helping other people as they learn about their cancer diagnosis and how they're going to adapt and deal through it and eventually become resilient with it. Speaking about it's an outlet for me. And I hope by speaking about it that I'm a support for others. That, that's amazing because I didn't know about the, the uh, neuropathy. And especially because you have to, you're going out different places. Like you say, you're doing your photo shoots outside, uh, mm-hmm. some of them. And then you're, you're, you're taking photos, which require you to, you know, use your hands to carry your bag and your camera. I, I just love everything about your story and being able to take everything that God has given you, whether it's good or bad, um, and, and be able to push your way through, see your way through. But then more importantly, like you said, advocate for others by telling your story, your testimony. Mm-hmm. When this pandemic hit and you facing your diagnosis and the things that could have set you back, you stood up even stronger. And then like going back to earlier, what you said, just changing how I operate my business model. One thing that you brought up and you said toward one of the questions was with the days that I have left, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How do you continue to move forward? Because some of us get so fearful of death. A lot of us will, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to go there. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to talk about that. Um, mm-hmm. What could you tell the listeners about that perspective? Because we're in COVID, people have lost family members, loved ones, and others who have had diagnosis that had nothing to do with COVID affected them. Just speak a little bit more for me on just how you've been able to carry yourself with that word there that my days, how does that, does it affect you negatively? Or do you use that to push and make every day even stronger, brighter, and more resilient? I would say I use it to push me to live my life, to be more resilient, because nobody's tomorrow is promised. We could all go at any moment for anything. Doesn't have to be cancer. I mean, we could just be walking outside. Tomorrow is not promised. Now, the cancer that I have, they don't stage it traditionally like, um, you know, stage one, two, three, and four, because non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is a blood cancer. And so it's throughout your body. So is not the same as most cancers. Prior to the medication, I'm on an immunity drug that I take daily now. And prior to going on that, the average prognosis was five to 11 years. And now with this new drug, immunotherapy that we're on, it's in extended that time frame. So depending on, you know, what other issues you have going on along with the cancer or the cancer has caused can shorten or lengthen that. But I would say when I hit the five-year mark, because that used to be the old prognosis, I was really scared of the end time now. And then Mm. when I got past that five-year mark and I started remembering, okay, be faithful, um, Mm. It was the sense, okay, I've made five years and, you know, then I've made another day. I've made another week. I've made another month and live my life as the best, you know, as I want to and the best that I can in spite of it, because in the big scheme of things, we don't know when we're going to go. None of us do. And so dwelling on, okay, well, I've got five to 11 years to live. it, it, It doesn't mean anything. It really doesn't. And I had to get to that point. I'm not saying it was immediate, but Right. Uh, You know, we just have to look at it that way. And then when we look at COVID, I lost a friend to COVID. We just buried him two months ago, 65 years old, no underlying conditions. But his mother, 91 years old, also had it. Don't know who infected who with it. She was asymptomatic, no symptoms, and she's still fine. Wow. He passed away. You know, so we don't know. We really don't. Mm -hmm. You know, we just have to be strong. I love it. And um, I just, and again, I love that you, because a lot of times when people hear, 
cancer, the immediate thought is, I, I don't know when they're going to pass away, you know, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. because that's what people's immediate reaction, you know, I've had friends who have, you know, got diagnosis. I'm like, we going to pray through this. <laughs> we going to hold hands and you're mm-hmm. going to get the treatment you need. And I'm going to be right here with you, like through it all. Don't worry. Um, And to your point, it could be cancer. It could be diabetes, like how my husband passed away. It could be anything, anything. but just anything. And I, I love that you brought that up because we get so, we gravitate. If you have COVID, oh, you're going to pass away. But that example, 6591, that's a mm-hmm. big difference. Yes. And she's still here. So we know that mm-hmm. God is just really in control of when we, we are, <laughs> when we're going to be here and when we're going. Right. Um, and if we're, we're being faithful and we're in his word and we're walking, whether I'm living or I'm dying, I'm still, I'm still good. I'm mm-hmm. okay. Um, mm-hmm. And I love that you brought that up and, and thank you for bringing that up because a lot of people in COVID, you know, we're all trying to box it in and figure out how you might die. Oh, well, if you have this, you you'll, you might pass away. So people look at it like that. And, and it's the same thing they do with cancer. When people hear cancer, the automatic thing is, oh man, they, they're probably going to pass away. But um, we don't know. And it's really truly about walking in faith, trusting God and living your life. And whenever he calls us home, he will call us home. Thank you so much for that, Dana. Um, so the, our last question before we wrap up is let people know how they can con- connect with you and your studio and tell us a little bit more about where we find you on social media uh, and if they want to get some photos done. Uh, yes, yeah, so you can go to my website, uh, DMS Creative Solutions. Uh, DMS is for my initials. Uh, Dana Marcel Scott, and also Dana Scott Photography. I have two websites. Um, Both websites will take you to um, the other website. Uh, If you Google me, you can find me on DMS Creative Solutions and lifestyle uh, portraits, uh, headshots, graduation, senior photos. I take those. I have several locations through Fayette County, as well as downtown Atlanta, for those who like to go downtown to take photos. And then, of course, like I stated, uh, branding photos. Um, And then you can find me on Instagram and also Facebook. I'm out there. I'm around and um, look forward to working with anybody that needs any photography needs, um, whether it's portraits or product photography. Perfect. Well, Dana, thank you so much for spending time on the Crown and Purpose podcast. We truly appreciate you being present. Thank you for sharing your story. And please, listeners, connect with Dana. Learn more about who she is, her photography, her studio. And of course, as we always say, connect, connect. That is so important. Well, Dana, again, thank you for spending this time with us. You guys, make sure that you're reading your words, staying in your word, trusting God in this journey as you get your crown and walk in purpose. And we appreciate you guys. And continue you all to listen share like and rate thank you so much again miss dana for spending this time with us and you guys have a blessed week